In our study for today, we want to deal with several arguments that are used by people who believe in the rapture uh, to teach that Jesus is going to have a coming, a secret coming, so to speak, before his glorious coming. Now, there's one passage in the New Testament which those who believe in the rapture use more frequently than any other passage. And I've never been able to understand how they can get a pre-tribulation rapture out of this passage. I'd like to read uh, that portion of Scripture as we begin our study today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we want to start reading at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. I believe this is the most quoted text by those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. It says there, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, that presents a problem in itself. Will God bring with him? Uh, we are going to deal with this text in our next series, which begins on September 20th. And so I'm not going to go into the issues raised by the idea that Jesus, that God is going to bring with Jesus those who went to sleep in him. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, by the way, the word coming there is parousia, shall not prevent, in other words, precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now, does that sound like some secret event? Uh, it sounds like everything except a secret event. And it continues saying, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Believe it or not, this is the passage which is used most frequently to teach a rapture before the great tribulation. Now, I would like us to take a look this uh, uh, presentation at some of the arguments that are used to try and prove that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture. The first of these is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. Here the Apostle Paul says this, and by the way, we're going to study this whole passage, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 10, later on in our series. It says there, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Here the Apostle Paul is saying, don't let anybody convince you that the day of Christ is at hand, that the day of Christ's coming is right around the door, even at the door. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the day of Christ's coming, the day of Christ, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, this expression, a falling away, is translated by many of those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture uh, in the following way. Uh, for example, Hal Lindsey says it's supposed to be translated the departure or the snatching away. In other words, this word here, which is translated in the King James Version, a falling away, should be translated a snatching away or a departure. In other words, it's referring to the departure or the snatching away of the saints at the moment of the rapture. Now, is this translation really acceptable? Is it really allowable? The fact is that it is not allowable by any stretch of your imagination. 
Actually, the Greek word that is used here is the word apostasia. In Spanish, we have that exact word. What does the word apostasia mean? Apostasia means apostasy. This is not talking about a snatching away of people to heaven. It's talking about a departure, yes, but a departure from the faith. An apostasy, in other words. Notice how this same word is used in the book of Acts, chapter 21 and verse 21. Acts chapter 21 and verse 21. Here we have the identical word, apostasia. And I want you to notice how it is used. It says there, And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest, that is, Paul is being accused, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. That word forsake is the word apostasia. What was Paul being accused of doing? He was accusing, he was accused of leading people astray from the teachings of Moses, wasn't he? In other words, apostatizing from the writings of Moses. It doesn't have anything to do with the departure or with the snatching away. It has to do with an apostasy from the accepted truth. And so it says that Paul supposedly was teaching the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their customs. And by the way, the King James Version actually does not translate the Greek the way it actually is. In the Greek, it does not say until a falling away comes. It says the falling away. This is a specific, well-known apostasy uh, to the Apostle Paul and to the people to whom the Apostle Paul was writing. So this first argument that the, the, the uh, departure, so-called here, is a departure from earth to heaven does not hold any water as you examine the word as it's found in the New Testament. It simply means apostatizing from the truth, abandoning the roots, the doctrinal roots that are accepted. So this first argument that is used in favor of the rapture that we're studying tonight does not hold any water. Now we need to take a look at a second argument that those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture use. That argument is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. Here it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Question, has God appointed his people to experience his wrath, according to this text? Will God's people fall under God's wrath? No. no. The Apostle Paul says, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now let me ask you, during the tribulation, will God pour out his wrath without mixture of mercy? Yes, Revelation speaks of, about the seven last plagues, and it actually says that he pours out his wrath unmixed with mercy. And the argument goes that if God pours out his wrath without mixture of mercy, how can God's people be on earth, earth if they're not appointed to experience God's wrath? Are you understanding the argument? The problem with that argument is that God can protect his people from his wrath even though he pours out his wrath. Let me give you some examples. Let me ask you, when the plagues were poured out upon Egypt, did those plagues fall among God's people? No, the plagues were for whom? For the wicked Egyptians that opposed God and his people. So if God was able to preserve his people while he was pouring out his wrath upon Egypt, why can't he preserve his people at the end while he's pouring out his wrath upon the earth? Also, let me ask you, do you remember the story of Daniel and his three friends when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? His three friends were thrown into the fiery furnace? Well, the fact is that in the fiery furnace, those who threw the three young men in were burned up in an instant. But what happened to those who were thrown into the fire? They were preserved by whom? By Jesus Christ himself, because Nebuchadnezzar said that the fourth was like the Son of God. In other words, Jesus entered the furnace and he preserved his people, whereas the wicked who threw them in were burned by the fire. 
And by the way, this story of Daniel 3 is a symbol of what's going to take place at the end of time. Nebuchadnezzar for a while was a beast, or he acted like a beast. He raised up an image, he commanded everyone to worship the image. Who would not, whoever would not worship the image would be killed. Do we find that scenario in Revelation chapter 13 on a worldwide scale? Is there going to be a beast who raises an image, who commands the whole world to worship the image to the beast, and whoever does not worship the image to the beast will be killed? Yes or no? Absolutely. So the story of Daniel 3 will be repeated. If God preserved the three young men in Daniel 3, why can't he preserve his people at the end of time when his wrath is being poured out? Are you following me? Also, Psalm 91, which has been called the tribulation psalm, and by the way, even uh, people who believe in the rapture accept that Psalm 90, 91 is describing uh, the, the, the wrath that will fall and the tribulation that will come uh, during this period. Psalm 91 and verse 10 says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. I want you also to notice Isaiah chapter 26 and verses 20 and 21. And I wish I had time to go into the context of, of this uh, passage, of these two verses. Because Isaiah 24 to 27 has been called the little book of Revelation in the Old Testament. The little apocalypse. Because everything uh, basic that is found in Revelation is found in Isaiah 24, 25, 26, and 27. Uh, actually, let's notice Isaiah chapter 26 and I would like to to read verse 19 and then we'll read verses 20 and 21. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust for thy dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out her dead. Is this speaking about the resurrection of the dead that the Apostle Paul speaks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in different terms? Absolutely. But now I want you to notice that there will be some people alive when uh, this event takes place. It says in verse 20, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. That that word indignation in the Old Testament refers to the outpouring of God's wrath. Verse 21, why do God's people need to hide for a moment while God's wrath passes over? Verse 21, for behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Are God's people going to be on earth during the tribulation? But will they hide? Will they be protected from the wrath of God during the tribulation? These two verses indicate that this is so. Now there's a third argument which is used by those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. It's based on Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Go with me to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Here uh, these words are given to the church of uh, Philadelphia and it says because thou hast kept the word of my patience I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation that which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So God's promise to the church of Philadelphia is that because they've kept the word of his patience, he will keep them from the hour of temptation or from the tribulation. And those who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture say, see, it says that God is going to keep his people from the tribulation. Is that really what the text is saying? Is it saying that God is going to keep his people from the tribulation or is he going to preserve his people in the tribulation? Well, let's go to John chapter 17 and verse 15. John chapter 17 and verse 15 where the same expression, keep, is used. The same expression, keep, uh, is used in John chapter 17 and verse 15. It says here uh, the following, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but, but that thou shouldest what? Keep them, the identical expression, keep them from evil. Let me ask you, can God 
leave his people on earth and still preserve them from evil yes. from the evil absolutely in fact Jesus actually says here I'm not praying that you take them out of the world he's saying there's I'm not praying that you have a pre-tribulation rapture here I'm praying that you will preserve them even though they are in the world also Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4 I'll just mention it in passing it says that uh, Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world what does that mean deliver us us from this evil present world. Does it mean that it's, he's going to take us out of this evil world that we live in? No. It means that he preserves us in the midst of this evil world. So can God preserve his people in the midst of the tribulation? Can he keep them from evil? Can he keep them in the hour of tribulation? The Bible says yes. Now a fourth argument which is used by those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says there, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. When Jesus comes, he's going to come with whom? He's going to come with all his saints. And those who believe in the tribulation like to say, he cannot come with his saints unless he came for them first. So this is an evidence that when Jesus comes, his saints have already previously been taken to heaven. At his glorious coming, seven years after the tribulation, he comes with his saints because he took them to heaven seven years before. Are you understanding the argument? Now the problem with this argument is that there is a verse in the Old Testament where this text comes from. Deuteronomy chapter 33, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 2. See, we have to look at everything the Bible has to say. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 2. It says here, and he said, this is speaking about the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came, notice this, with ten thousands of his what? Of his saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. It says here that when God gave the law, he came with ten thousand of his what? Of his saints. Now the question is, who were those saints? People that have been raptured to heaven before he gave the law on Mount Sinai? <laughs> Obviously not. Those saints, 10,000 of his saints, refers to what? To the angels. In fact, Revelation speaks of them as 10,000 times 10,000 and thousand of thousands of thousands. So the saints in Deuteronomy 33 verse 2 refers to what? refers to angels. By the way, do you know that uh, the angels are called saints? You say the angels are called saints? Yes, they are. Go with me to Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. It says there, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the what? Holy angels. Now you say, where is the word saints there? The fact is that the word holy is the word saints. In Spanish, uh, we, we have only one word for holy. What is the Spanish word for holy? Santo, santos, same as the word saints. In other words, this could be translated that Jesus is going to come with his saintly angels. So are the angels called saints or are they called holy? Absolutely. By the way, when Jesus comes, is he going to come with the heavenly armies? Revelation chapter 19, John sees heaven opened. 
And uh, Jesus is seated on a white horse. He's coming from heaven to earth. In verse 14, it says that the armies of heaven followed Jesus on white horses. What were those armies of heaven that John saw following Jesus from heaven to earth? They are the what? They are the angels. So when 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13 says that Jesus will come with all of his saints, it's talking about him coming with whom? Coming with his holy angels, biblically, uh, because there is no tribulation rapture. Now, a fifth argument, which is used in favor of a pre-tribulation rapture, is based on Luke chapter 21 and verse 36. Luke chapter 21 and verse 36. It's based on the word escape. It says there the following. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, Jesus is speaking, that ye may be accounted worthy to what? To escape all these things that shall come to pass, and now comes a very important expression, and to what? To stand before the Son of Man. Did you catch that? Two key words, escape and what? Stand. Now, does this necessarily mean that people are going to escape the world because these things are going to take place on planet Earth? Or can you escape from these things while you're on Earth? Obviously, you can escape while you're on Earth. And by the way, I want you to notice something very interesting in this verse. Is it true that you escape from these things and then you stand before the Son of Man? Do you notice the order? You escape these things in the tribulation, and then you stand in front of the Son of Man. Let me ask you, does the tribulation take place before the second coming of Christ? Is that clear in the Bible? It's absolutely clear. Now, are God's people going to escape before they stand before the Son of Man, according to this text? Absolutely. Now, when will God's people have to stand before the Son of Man? Notice Revelation chapter 6 and verses 16 and 17. Revelation chapter 6 and verses 16 and 17. This is speaking about the second coming, the glorious second coming of Christ. By the way, this is not talking about, uh, about the rapture, even according to those who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. This is speaking about the glorious coming of Christ. And it says here in, in Revelation 6 verses 16 and 17, about the wicked and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to what? Who shall be able to stand? Is there going to be a group on earth that will be able to stand when Jesus comes? According to this text. Yes. Is the expression to stand used also in Luke? The passage that we used in Luke. Absolutely. So you have the tribulation and people escape the tribulation, which means that they are not impacted by the wrath of God in the tribulation. And then at the end of the tribulation, there's a group who is able to what? To stand before the Son of Man, or it speaks here about standing before the Lamb as he's sitting on his throne. Is this point clear? Now, Let's go to a sixth argument that they use, and we're going to deal with seven arguments tonight. The sixth argument is based on Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Let's read that verse, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, believe it or not, those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture say that this verse is talking about the rapture. When John is told, Come up hither, it means that John is a symbol of the church and is talking about the rapture of the church. Have any of you read that before? in the writings of those who believe in the rapture? That's what's taught. And then they say that the rest of Revelation has to do with the Jews. It has nothing to do with the Christian church because the church will be raptured away to heaven. John represents the church. When he is invited to go to heaven, actually it means that the church will be raptured to heaven. Now there are serious problems with this view. And what are the problems? Well, the problem, the major problem, is that from chapter 4 to chapter 19, John is not in heaven all the time. 
Actually, if you read Revelation, he goes to heaven in the Spirit. By the way, it says in chapter 4 and verse 2 that he goes to heaven in the Spirit. Do you know what that means, to go to heaven in the Spirit? It means that he's going in what? In vision, exactly, because visions and dreams are a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he goes to heaven supposedly here, but then a little bit later on in Revelation chapter 14, it says, I saw an angel descend from heaven. Uh-oh, he's on earth now. Revelation 18, uh, this mighty angel that fills the earth with his glory, he says, I saw an angel descend from heaven. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3, it says that the angel takes John in the spirit and he takes him to the wilderness. I guess that means that the church that has been raptured to heaven during the tribulation is going to be transported to the wilderness. Does that make sense? And Revelation 9, uh, 21 verses 9 and 10, it says that John is transported in the spirit to the new Jerusalem. So here he's going to the New Jerusalem, he's coming down to the desert, he see this angel coming down from heaven, obviously he is on earth. So obviously, Revelation 4 verse 1 does not mean that the church was raptured to heaven and stays in heaven for seven years. Because in Revelation there is a back and forth of John. Are you understanding my point? Furthermore, there's another problem with this view. You see, people like Hal Lindsey, they take a stringent literalism. They apply a stringent literalism to the book of Revelation. They say that everything is to be taken literally. And they say that after Revelation 4 verse 1, everything applies to the Jews, whereas in Revelation 1 to 3, everything applies to the church. They say the only part of Revelation that has to do with the church is Revelation 1 to 3, the seven churches. And most of them say that the seven churches represent uh, the history of the Christian church from the days of the apostles until the end of time. At least Hal Lindsey believes that. But now Hal, Hal Lindsey has a very, very big problem. Because when you go, for example, to the church of Thyatira, whom Hal Lindsey believes to be the papal church, the period of the Middle Ages, it says that that church allows that woman Jezebel to entice my servants to sacrifice to idols and to commit fornication. Now we've got a problem. Because this is happening, according to Hal Lindsey himself, it's happening during the 1260 years as we know it. It's happening during the period of the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Now, where was Jezebel during the Middle Ages? Where was literal Jezebel? She was dead. Long time dead. And yet, it says there that the church of Thyatira allowed the one Je woman Jezebel, who is an Old Testament personage that has to do with literal Israel, and she's enticing the church to do these things. Let me ask you, is Jezebel being used symbolically here? Yes. yes. So what allows Hal Lindsey to say, Jezebel is symbolic here, but when you get to the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, they are literal. I mean, you have to have principles when you study Scripture. The book of Revelation is speaking in symbolic terminology. You have, to, you have to interpret the symbols. You have to get beyond the literal symbol and find out what it means. And so this idea that Revelation 4 verse 1 is referring to the rapture simply is not in harmony with Scripture. Do you understand this point that I've shared with you? Okay, now let's go to our last point, and this is going to take us longer than all of the previous points. This is point number seven. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and verses 32 and 33. Matthew chapter 24 and verses 32 and 33. It's speaking here about the fig tree. And I'm going to read the verse and then I'm going to make an explanation. It says, Jesus is speaking, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So as a fig tree begins to bud, and it's a sign that the summer is near, this is a sign that uh, when you see all of these things in Matthew chapter 24, that the end is near. And basically the argument goes like this. The fig tree represents Israel. And by the way, that's true. The fig tree represents Israel. And the budding of the fig tree represents the reestablishment of the state of Israel in 1948. And they believe that this is the greatest sign 
that Jesus is coming soon to rapture his church. It's the greatest sign. There are many signs, but this is the greatest one of all. Now, those of you who have heard these views, am I being accurate in the way that I'm projecting this? Amen. Yes, <laughs> I heard an amen. You, you know that I'm projecting this accurately. Now, the fig tree does represent Israel, but the question is, is the reestablishment of Israel in harmony with the plan of God, and is it really a sign that the rapture is close by? Well, let's examine this in the light of the Gospels. Go with me to Matthew chapter 3, and we've got to really go quickly. Matthew chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10. Matthew 3 verses 9 and 10. Here John the Baptist is preaching. By the way, John the Baptist began preaching six months before Jesus was, uh, began his ministry at his baptism. Now, we can't go through the chronology right now. You have to accept that by faith. John the Baptist began his ministry six months before Jesus began his. Now, I want you to notice Matthew chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness. It says there, and he's speaking to the Jewish leaders, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Notice there's an axe, and the axe is going to be laid at the root of the trees. In other words, the tree is going to be what? Cut down. Which trees are going to be cut down? Let's continue reading. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Which is the tree which will be hewn down or chopped down, and, uh, chopped off and uh, thrown into the fire? It is the tree which does not bear what? fruit. And he's speaking to whom here? He's speaking to the religious leaders of the Jewish nation. He's saying, you are a tree, and if that tree does not produce fruit, it's going to be what? It's going to be chopped down. Now, we don't know at this point how the message of John the Baptist was received, because the story was taking place at that point. Go with me now to Luke chapter 13, and let's notice another tree episode. Luke chapter 13, and verses 1 through 9. And we'll go through this quickly. It says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Now, do you think they're, you're better than they are because this calamity came to them and hasn't come to you? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And now he's going to illustrate his point with a parable. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. What is the problem of this fig tree? It has no fruit. Now let's continue reading. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit. Now we need to stop there a minute. These three years. Most scholars who have studied the chronology of the Gospel of Luke agree that this parable was told by Jesus two and a half years into his ministry. Now how long has the call been made for the tree to produce fruit? Three years. How long did John the Baptist preach? Six months. How long has Jesus been preaching when he tells this parable? Two and a half years. How many years is that? Three years. Had this tree, which represents the Jewish nation, had it borne fruit yet? No. Let's continue. It says, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. What's the counsel? By the way, this is God the Father speaking to his son. What? Cut it down. Does that fit what John the Baptist said? Every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down? Absolutely. 
Why cumbereth it the ground? In other words, why should we even allow it to occupy a space? And he answering said unto them, unto him, Lord, notice that the, that the vine dresser is, is concerned about his tree. And he says, Lord, let it alone this year also. How many more years? One more year. How much longer was the ministry of Jesus going to last? How long did Jesus minister in this earth? And I'm not talking about when he grew up, from the point of his baptism. Three and a half years. And till this point, two and a half years of his ministry has passed. How many years are left? Interesting chronology, isn't it? And so it says here, uh, Let it this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, that is fertilize it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And the parable ends. Nobody knows what happened to this fig tree at this point. Did it bear fruit? For three years it hasn't. It hasn't responded to the message of John the Baptist. It has not responded to the message of Jesus. Now is it just possible that we'll meet this fig tree again? If the parable leaves us in suspense, it must be that at some point we're going to know what happened to this fig tree, whether it bore fruit or not. Go with me to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verses 19 and 20. See, you have to thread all these things together. You can't just say, oh yeah, the fig tree is Israel, and the budding is the establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948. Boy, that's a real stretch. Isn't it a stretch? Tremendous. Notice Mark chapter 11, verses 19 and 20. It says there, speaking about Jesus, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. By the way, this is happening three days before the death of Christ. Has just about a year passed? Yes or no? Yes. Just about that year. And so it says, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. What part of forever don't you understand? And then it says, and presently the fig tree, what? Withered away. And when even was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. What happens when a tree dries up from the roots? Is it ever going to live again? It is not going to live again. Let me ask you, what does this fig tree represent? It represents what? Israel. Had Jesus come seeking fruit from Israel? Yes. Had Israel borne any fruit? Absolutely not. And so what is the counsel? No fruit from now on will ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered away because it dried up from its what? From its roots. In other words, is this fig tree going to play a role in the future? Absolutely not. Now, we need to go to Luke chapter 21 and notice a very important detail. Luke chapter 21 and verses 29 and 30. This is the parallel passage to what we read in Matthew 24 about when you see the budding of the fig tree. Now, notice what we find in Luke chapter 21 and verses 29 and 30. It says, And he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees... When they, sh when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. What is the difference between Matthew and Luke? Did you catch those of you who are careful readers? Matthew said only the fig tree. When you see the fig tree bud, what does it say in Luke? Behold the fig tree and all the trees. I guess that means that, that uh, there's going to be many nations established in 1948. You see, Jesus is not using the fig tree here as a symbol of Israel. He's simply using an analogy or an illustration. He's saying, as when you look at a fig tree and you see it budding, you know the summer is near, you need to know that when you see all these signs, by the way, it's not the sign, 1948, but when you see all these signs in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, then you know that the end is near. 
In other words, he's not making a point that the fig tree represents the rebirth of the nation of Israel. He's simply using this as an illustration of the necessity of watching the signs in order to know when Jesus is near, even at the door. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 21 and verses 12 and 13. This is the triumphal entry of Jesus. Let's pursue this a little bit more. Matthew chapter 21 verses 12 and 13, and we've read this before. It's when Jesus, at the end of the triumphal entry, enters the temple in Jerusalem. It says, and Jesus went into the temple of God. What is it called? The temple of God at this point. And cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house, what does he call the temple of God? He calls it my house. My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. But then a few chapters later, actually two chapters later, in Matthew 23 verse 38, Jesus leaves the Jerusalem temple. No longer does it say that he left the temple of God or that he leaves my house. In fact, he's preached in Matthew chapter 21, 22, and 23. He has made a call to the Jewish nation to receive him as the Messiah. And they've rejected his last call. And therefore, when he leaves the temple, he says, Lo, your house is left unto you, what? Desolate. And then he speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem. What is it that brought about the destruction of Jerusalem? It was the fact that the temple was left what? Desolate. And why was it left desolate? Because Jesus left the temple because Israel rejected him. Now let's uh, go in our minds to something that we've studied before. The conclusion of the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Did you notice that I didn't deal much with the ending point of the 70 weeks? We just basically covered elements that had to do with the middle of the week. You know, the sacrifice and the oblation would cease, and the Messiah would be cut off, not for himself. We dealt with that, but we didn't deal with the ending point of the 70 weeks. And so we need to take a look at that. How long a probation did God give to the Jewish nation? He gave them 490 years, right? 70 full weeks. Would you agree that was 70 full weeks? Absolutely, 70 full weeks. Let me ask you then, was the Jewish nation rejected when Christ was nailed to the cross? Was it? Did it come to an end? Why not? It couldn't have come to an end because he was crucified in the middle of the last week. And how long was given to the Jewish nation? A full 490 years. And there were still three and a half years to take place. Are you with me? Yes or no? Raise your hand if you're with me. Now, I read, for example, Matthew 10 verses 5 and 6 where Jesus says that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not to the Gentiles. He says to the disciples, don't go to the Samaritans. Don't go to the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. By the way, do you know that after Jesus was crucified, the door of mercy was still open for the Jewish nation for three and a half years? Notice, for example, Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. Here we find that after the day of Pentecost, Israel could still repent. It says there in Acts chapter 5 and verse 31, Him hath God exalted, that is Jesus, hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior. For what reason? For to give repentance to whom? To Israel and forgiveness of sins. By the way, do you know that the first seven chapters of Acts, the gospel goes only to the Jews? I don't know whether you were aware of that. But in Acts 1 through 7, the focus of the apostles is Jerusalem and Judea. They don't go to the Gentiles. Are they still going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? They most certainly are, because they're still three and a half years. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 23 and verse 34. Matthew chapter 23 and verses 34 to 36. Very important passage. Notice the tense of the verbs. It says there, Jesus speaking, he's rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. Wherefore, behold, notice this, 
I send unto you, actually the, the verb is in the future tense in the Greek. I will send to you prophets and wise men and scribes. What three categories? Prophets, wise men, and what? Scribes. Th that would be theologians. And some of them ye shall what? Kill and crucify. And some of them shall ye what? Scourge in your synagogues. And persecute them from what? From city to city. Now do you notice what we find here? Notice the tense of the verbs. It says, some of them ye shall kill and crucify. Is this future from the time that Jesus is going to die? Absolutely. And it says, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues. Is this future from the time of the death of Christ? Absolutely yes. And then notice, when they do this, when they persecute the prophets and the wise men and the scribes, then Jesus says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come to pass upon this generation. Does probation close for the Jews after Jesus sends prophets, wise men, and scribes to them after his death? According to this passage. Absolutely. Now, we need to take a look at the three categories. Prophets. Jesus says, I'll send you prophets. Let me ask you, was the Apostle Peter a prophet? Was he able to read the mind of Ananias and Sapphira? On the day of Pentecost, did he interpret prophecy as a prophet? He most certainly did. Now, it speaks also about um, crucifying and killing certain individuals. Does the Bible tell us that Saul of Tarsus went about killing the Christians before he was converted? Yes. In fact, did he participate in the killing of Stephen? He most certainly did. It also says that these would be crucified from, uh, I mean persecuted from city to city. Let me ask you, did Saul of Tarsus, according to his own admission, go from city to city to persecute the Christians? Yes, he did. It also says that wise men would be persecuted. Do you know that that is referring to the seven deacons? It says that these men who were whose hands were laid, who, who had hands laid upon them, it says that they were to choose wise men to lay their hands on. So let me ask you, is the door of probation still open for the Jewish nation even to the point of what Saul of Tarsus is doing? Obviously, yes, the door has not closed. Now, what is the ending point of the prophecy of the 70 weeks? It has to do uh, with the fig tree. You see, the, in the fig tree, Jesus is pronouncing the sentence. But three and a half years, he lingers and he says, I think I'll hold off to see if my people will accept me or not. Isn't he a wonderful God? Jesus is a wonderful person. I mean, even though he could have closed the door of mercy right there on the cross of Calvary when, when he was crucified, he says, I'm going to fulfill my promise in the book of Daniel. I'm going to give them exactly 70 weeks. I'm going to give them three and a half additional years. Now let me ask you, what is it that marks the ending point of the 70 weeks? We need to go to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. There's a very key expression that we find here, which I want to deal with very briefly. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Speaking about the accomplishments that take place during the 70 weeks, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. To finish the transgression, because Jesus is going to die on the cross, and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Did Jesus reconcile us to God? Yes, he did. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Did Jesus bring in everlasting righteousness? Can he become our righteousness now when he died? Yes. And now comes the expression I want us to know less. And to seal up the vision and prophecy. Now that expression, to seal up, is the exact expression which is translated early in that verse to make an end of sins. In other words, to seal up prophecy and vision is the same expression as to make an end of sins. In other words, what is going to come to an end? 
prophecy and vision for Israel are going to come to an end. Now my question is, who was the last prophet given to Israel and who was the one who received the last vision in Israel? I think you know the answer. It is Stephen. Did he bring vision and prophecy to an end for the Jewish nation? Yes. Was he a prophet? Yes, he was. Did he have a vision? He most certainly had a vision of Jesus and he shared it. Now allow me to share some very interesting points with you. If you notice in Acts chapter 7 where it speaks about the stoning of Stephen, you'll find that Stephen gives an, an inordinately long discourse about the history of Israel. It goes from verse 2 to verse 53. Remember, he's speaking to the Jewish leaders, to the Sanhedrin. They must have been bored to death when they were hearing the reenactment of the telling of the story of Israel. They say, yeah, 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 we've heard this before. Why would Stephen dedicate all of this chapter to recite the history of Israel? Let me tell you why. Because Stephen is playing the role of the prophet. You see, in the Old Testament, when the prophets came against Israel, you can find this time and again, when they came to rebuke Israel for her sins, they would recite all of the benevolent acts that God had performed during the history of Israel. By the way, this is in the material on Daniel 9. There's a whole seven or eight pages at the end with everything I'm giving you now. Uh, you know, and with examples of how the prophets in the Old Testament would recite the history of Israel and say how God was wonderful with you, but you have abandoned the Lord, you have forsaken the Lord, you have turned your back on the Lord, and therefore God has come against you in judgment. But, but if you repent, then God will relent from pro proclaiming the judgment. In other words, Stephen is playing the same role in the book of Acts that the prophets of the Old Testament played with Israel. Are you following what I'm saying? He's playing the exact role of the prophet. And he is speaking to none less than the Jewish leaders, the supreme court of Judaism known as the Sanhedrin. This is the final prophet who is making a final call to Israel by making a recital of the history of Israel. Now as Stephen reaches the end of his presentation to these leaders, to the supreme court of the Jewish nation, he says some very strong words. Notice Acts chapter 7 and verses 51 to 53. He says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now be become betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now, there's a very interesting point in Acts chapter 7. You'll notice that all the way from the beginning of Acts 7, actually in verses 11, 19, 38, 44, and 45, Stephen, when he speaks to them, he says, Our fathers, our fathers, our fathers. But when he gets here to the end of the chapter, he no longer says, Our fathers, he says, Your fathers. That's an important point. What is Stephen doing? He is disconnecting himself from the patrimony of literal Israel. Because literal Israel is about to be what? Cut off. And he does not want to include himself among them. That's different than the prophets in the Old Testament. Prophets in the Old Testament included themselves in the problem. For example, in Daniel 9, he says, We have sinned. We have performed iniquity. We have done this. Please, Lord, forgive our sin. Stephen does that throughout most of chapter 7. But when he gets to the end, now he's indicting Israel. Now he says, Your fathers, you have done this. In other words, he's disconnecting himself from literal Israel. Notice Acts chapter 7 verses 40, 54 to 58. What was the verdict of the, of the Sanhedrin? By the way, when the Supreme Court made the decision, that was the final word. It was the decision of the Jewish nation. Notice verse 54. When they heard these things, did they repent? No. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed out, out on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Is he seeing a vision? 
Yes, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Some scholars believe that he's actually seeing the second coming of Christ. And I believe that that's true because in Matthew 26, verse 64, uh, Jesus spoke to the Jewish leaders, to Annas and Caiaphas, and he says, you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of God, standing at the right hand of God. And said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a, a young man's, uh, excuse me, the clothes at the young man's feet whose name was what? Whose name was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Has the Jewish nation made its decision through the Supreme Court? Is this the final rejection? Is this the final call by the prophet? Yes, it is. Is it the final vision given to literal Israel? It most certainly is. But you know, God is a wise God. The very moment that the door closed for the Jewish nation, God was choosing the champion who would open it for the Gentiles. At that very event. Isn't that true? The door was closing. The Sanhedrin said, we don't want him. But there was one there who was participating in this who was actually going to be converted and be God's apostle to the Gentiles. In other words, when one door closed, God is opening the other door at that very event. Notice Acts 22, verses 20 and 21. Speaking about, about the experience of Saul of Tarsus, and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And now notice, and he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Do you see how the two are connected? The stoning of Stephen and Saul of Tarsus going to the Gentiles? By the way, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus told the disciples that they were to go first of all where? To Jerusalem, Judea. to Judea, Samaria. to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the what? Of the earth. Do you know that the book of Acts is organized in this fashion? That's the key verse that gives us the organization of the book of Acts. In Acts 1 through 6, the disciples go to Jerusalem and Judea. You can read it. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. In Acts chapter 8, they're going to Samaria. In Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus is converted. And in Acts chapter 10, the message goes to the Gentiles. And the rest of the book of Acts has to do with Paul's travels to the far places of the Roman Empire. Are you following me? So what is God doing at the stoning of Stephen? He's saying, yes, the door of mercy has closed for the Jewish nation. By the way, not for individual Jews. For the nation, for the theocracy. How do we know that it didn't close for individual Jews? Because Saul of Tarsus was later converted and God included him among his true Israel. Are you following me? Now, notice. Acts chapter 13 is a very important chapter. It marks the beginning of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. I'm going to go through it quickly because time is almost up. In chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Paul and Barnabas are set aside by the laying on of hands. This is the beginning of his ministry. Then they go to uh, Antioch of Pisidia. And the apostle Paul preaches to the Jews in the synagogue. That's found in chapter 13, verses 16 to 41. When Paul preaches, the Gentiles are so impressed that by what Paul said to the Jews that they said, we'd like to hear the message too. And so the next Sabbath, the Apostle Paul gathers and he preaches to the Gentiles. In fact, it says in chapter 13 and verse 44 that the whole city came out to listen to the message of the Apostle Paul. There were so many people that the Jews got jealous. And they started blaspheming and contradicting what the Apostle Paul was saying. Now I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul had to say to them. Chapter 13, verses 46 and 47. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But why was it spoken first to them? Why was it proper for the word to be spoken to them first? Because the 70 weeks applied to them. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the what? 
to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Is this clear? The stoning of Stephen marks the end of the prophecy of the 70 weeks, the rejection of the Jewish theocracy. Do you know what the devil did? One of the worst things in history, probably the worst war crime in the history of the world was, was what the Nazis did, the Holocaust. Over six million Jews killed, many of them incinerated. Who do you suppose was behind this? Satan. Just because they were rejected as a Jewish, as, as the theocracy, does not mean that God is against them and God is cursing them. God wants to save the Jews. He loves the Jews. He loves everybody of every nation. It's just that he, he put an end to the Jewish theocracy as his chosen nation to fulfill his purpose and his will. Do you know that the devil had a bigger agenda than just killing six million Jews? When people found out what had happened in Germany and Poland and some of these other places, they were horrified. And there was a movement in the world that Israel should have its own homeland as a result. And that's why in 1948 the state of Israel was established. Do you know that the devil was the one orchestrating this so that the state of Israel would be established? Now you're saying, you're saying that it's the devil's plan that the state of Israel be established? Let me explain the reason why. You see Christians, Protestants today, believe that 1948 is the greatest sign of the rapture. And they're directing all eyes where? To the Middle East. Let me ask you, who do you suppose is causing these controversies and conflicts between the Jews and the Palestinians? Who's causing it? Satan. Is it because he hates the Jews? Does he hate the Jews any more than he hates anybody else? They're not the theocracy anymore. So he doesn't hate them any more than anybody else. Why would he stir things up between Jews and Palestinians? Why would he lead to the establishment of the state of Israel? Why would he lead to 9-11, where from over there, the terrorists caused this in the United States? Why is the question? Because Satan wants people to turn their eyes where? He wants people to turn their eyes to the Middle East for the fulfillment of prophecy. Because the devil wants to hide the fact that prophecy is being fulfilled in Rome and in the United States and people can't see it because they're looking where? They're looking in the wrong place. That's the reason why we have so much turmoil over in the Middle East. Because the devil wants to direct eyes over there when prophecy is being fulfilled in the West. And he tries, to, he tries to say that the issues are the oil of the Middle East. And, and the fact that the Jews, you know, it's an ethnic battle between the Jews and the Arabs. And, and it's going to be between the, the Russians and the Arabs and the Chinese coming against the Jews. And what does that have to do with righteousness by faith? What spiritual issues are involved there? Absolutely none. The devil wants to hide the spiritual issues. And I'll end with this verse, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus is speaking about the moment of the sixth plague. And he says that we're supposed to watch and we're supposed to be awake. Lest when this time comes, we are found naked and they see our shame. The issue is whether you're dressed with the righteousness of Christ or not, whether you've received Jesus or not. That is the issue. And Satan wants to hide it by bringing into perspective all other kinds of issues because he doesn't want people to come to Christ and truly commit their lives to him. He wants people to believe a totally unspiritual perspective of prophecy. Did you understand what we talked about tonight? critical issues that we must share with those who misunderstand these things, lest they be found in the tribulation, the worst period in the history of the world, without a shelter, without the faith to stand. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of studying these things this evening. We ask that you will write them in our minds and in our hearts. You will help us to share them with others. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen.